Hallå. Hej, uh, välkommen till plattform. Um, I will do this in English as usually because the talks will be in English afterwards. Um, just like to welcome you all to platform, which is uh, for those of you who are not familiar with platform, it's uh, the lecture series of Bergen Kunsthal. And uh, tonight it's the last uh, talk in the series for 2009, and uh, we are very pleased uh, to have with us Matthias Donbolt and Jane Rowley for tonight. Uh, Matthias is a PhD student in art history at the university here in Bergen and also a founding editor of Trickster, the Nordic queer journal. Um, Jane Rowley, uh, she has an MA in uh, women's studies uh, from York University and a master of research from the London uh, Consortium, uh, where she has specialized in found footage film and the family archive. Um, that's the short versions of their backgrounds. Uh, you can read more about them in their little folders um, that's laying around here. Um, I will not talk too much about uh, their presentation because they will uh, introduce themselves um, uh, themselves. But uh, um, the title for today is um, Archive Trouble, Queer Art and Theory. Uh, and Matthias Dunbolt and Jane Rowley have both been involved in, uh, in a project called Lost and Found, which is an exhibition um, and a book, uh, this book here. Um, Jane as a co-curator of the exhibition and Matthias as a co-editor of this book. Um, the book is actually also available in uh, the Kunsthal, so um, tomorrow or later it's available to buy there. Um, and you can probably also talk to, to these two afterwards. Um, um, yeah, this exhibition uh, has been on display in Copenhagen this year and will be shown in Umeå uh, next year. Um, we have been in, Matthias informed us about this project some time ago, so at the Berlin Kunsthal we have been following this project with interest. And, uh, when we received the book some time ago, um, it seemed like a very good idea to invite them here to, to talk about the, the, the sort of main topics that are being uh, highlighted in, the, in this project, um, which is how a queer perspective challenges uh, artistic and archival practices, and uh, also questions of what is included and what is excluded in uh, traditional history writing. These are two sort of main aspects that are being um, discussed um, in different ways in the book and the exhibition. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, welcome to the stage to Matthias and Jane. Thanks a lot, and thanks to Bern Kunsthal for inviting us both here today. Matisse is a homeboy from Bern, but for me it's the first time I'm in Norway, so it's a really big privilege to be here. Oh, I have to be closer. And I also have to speak more slowly than I normally do, so please, if I start gabbling, babbling, get too excited, just stick your hand in the air and say slow down. Um, the format for this evening we thought would be that I'd speak for around 30 minutes showing some of the works from the exhibition, talking about myself and Luisa Valdos, my co-curator's curatorial practice, political motivation for the exhibition. And then we're going to take a short break. Yeah. And then Matthias, um, <coughs> who's edited this book together with me and Luisa, will talk about some of the wider framework of queer theory and the archive, and also discuss some of the works. Yep, that is the plan. Yeah. We'll and just interrupt us if you don't understand words or weird concepts we use or if we speak too, too fast. So just really, we're not scared of being interrupted. We like it. Huh? Actually, we do. Okay, so we're here today to talk about and hopefully make a little bit of archive trouble. Um, the basis, as the introducer said, is the exhibition Lost and Found, Queering the Archive. Uh, curated by myself and Luisa Valdez, and with the publication of the same name, edited by Matthias, myself and Luisa. Querying is questioning from a queer political perspective, and that's what we're here to do today. We want to ask questions. Um, we don't have all the answers, and we really hope you'll do the same. Ask us questions so this evening turns into a conversation we hopefully all can continue. 
Lost and Found, Queering the Archive is an international exhibition of 13 contemporary artists focusing on memory and the writing of history in relationship to gender and sexuality. The artworks all question what's lost in traditional archive compilation and canon creation. What's included, what's excluded. How is history written and whose history is told. In the exhibition, experience is not shared by the majority and not only remembered, but also expressed in an alternative language. We hope their artistic visions of histories compiled, written or performed from queer perspectives, using the potent and emotionally laden detritus of society. In Lost and Found, the works in the exhibition, this includes found footage from silent movies, from B-movies, garments and rooms from the family past, a jukebox archive of pop songs, everyday objets trouvés, and alternative family albums. What I'd like to do uh, over the next about 30 minutes is present the exhibition, and as I said, some of the political issues that motivated Louisa and I as curators. And with 13 international artists, it would be impossible to do all the works in the exhibition justice. We love them all. So Matthias and I have divided the spoils and will present a few selected work each. And Matthias, maybe you'd like to tell people what they can look forward to. Yep. After the break, um, I'm going to present a bit more of the, the book, um, Lost and Found. And in the book, you can see just briefly here what it, is, what it includes. It's kind of divided into two parts, one with more text, one with artworks. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about the more theoretical um, background for the exhibition and the, the project in itself. Um, talk a bit about what queer theory is and what queering theory maybe do. Uh, questioning what we think as theory and history and, and, um, and archives. So, a bit more about archives specifically, perhaps, after the break. And he's really good. Um, to welcome you to the world of Lost and Found, I'd like to start with the exhibition text that welcomed visitors to Konstell and Nikolai this summer, and we'll be doing so again at Bildmuseet in Umeå, Sweden, from the end of January in the new year. I'd like to run briefly through the text, which we divided into three sections, separating and hopefully explaining the title, framed by questions we saw as key. How is history written? Whose history is told? What is included? And crucially, what is excluded? Number one, Lost and Found. We chose the title Lost and Found because Lost and Found offices, what's that in Norwegian? Um, Hittegodskontor. Yeah, okay. You know. I looked it up. Our repositories for the forgotten and left behind, for the discarded and disregarded, for stuff, ephemera, the on and undervalued. And for us, lost and found offices also symbolize a place for memories and experiences not represented in official archives of the past, official versions of the past, for remembrances and lives that challenge the norm and normativity. Querying. Queer was originally a homophobic slur. Politically reclaimed, we claim that queer offers a critique of the way we categorize each other, asking, what do you do? Where are you from? Which actually means, who are you? And how do you fit in, or not, the ready-made boxes of identity? We hope that the works in the exhibition Lost and Found question or query the interrogative power of labels, with an obviously strong focus in this exhibition on the way we think and crucially do gender and sexuality. Number three, the archive. According to Derek, Derrida and co, this is the symbolic memory of society, allegedly representing our collective history. I'm not sure how many of you here tonight use or have used archives, but they're a personal fetish of mine and yours. Mm. Yeah. I love flicking through index cards. I love the hunt and hope of discovery. But the traditional archive is neither objective nor all-inclusive. So instead of classifiable and verifiable documents, in these queer artists' archives, you'll found, find film fragments, like I said, pop songs, embodied terms of abuse, and fictionalized love stories, as well as fictionalized pasts. Our lost and found office is full of the very stuff of life, memories of desire, outrage, intimacy loss, discrimination, and love. We ended our statement, as you can see here, which, with what for us as curators were three crucial questions for visitors and for all of us here this evening. What's in your archive? What do you remember? And crucially, what would you rather forget? 
Discussing the entrance text brings me back to the beginnings of Lost and Found, a kind of good point for discussing Louisa and mine's curatorial considerations and practice because the seed for Lost and Found was sown way back in 2005, when the Danish cultural festival Aarhus Festu announced woman as its theme. It seemed for me and Louisa strangely difficult to imagine a huge cultural festival. I mean, it lasts a week, it's theater, it's dance, it's music, it's art, it's everything, um, called man. It seemed that women apparently are the only ones with a gender. Men are, well, kind of just people. The theme of woman was later branded with the festival title, Womania. Mania, by any standard dictionary definition, is a form of mental illness in which the manic is overactive, overexcited, and unreasonably happy. So not only were women the only gender, they were apparently raving mad too. And it got even better when the poster campaign was launched. The colors were funky, the graphics contemporary, the message was not. The PR and poster campaign, where the sexualized pubic triangle combined with a doormat, literally, a cheese grater, and a fuckable naughty but nice cream cake sent women, no mistake about it, right back to the 50s. In response, we developed a queer exhibition that found no home back then. During its development, we trawled through exhausting amounts of rainbow themes, pretty lousy paintings of Cox, Cunts, and same-sex relationships. We got bored, we got the giggles. This was not and is not what queer art or curation is for either of us or the artist in Lost and Found. For Louisa and I, as queer thinking feminists, our focus was not solely on gender, but on exclusion and inclusion. The creation of minorities and majorities across the intersectional spectrum of gender, race, class, and sexual orientation. We wanted to take issue with the way we all categorize each other, with a strong focus on gender and sexuality. We choose to use querying to question definitions of real men, real women, and prevalent images of desire and relationships, to criticize essentialist identity categories, be they social, political, or visual. But there was an inbuilt paradox in our curatorial practice, because in choosing works and artists, we constantly operated with an internal 50-50 gender quota. How so? If one of our goals was to question identity categories, to undo gender, as Judith Butler says, surely the gender of the artist should play no role, not be relevant. But what we realized was the male dominance of the art world in terms of recommendations, promotion, visibility, who knows who, would have, without this quota, resulted in yet another exhibition with an overrepresentation of men. Business as usual. Male dominance of the straight art world is well documented, but in exhibitions where the vast majority of artists define their work as queer or anti-heteronormative, sadly so. Even when we looked at huge and inspiring exhibitions like the Eighth Square, Gender, Desire and Life in, uh, Gender, Life and Desire in Art since 1960 in Cologne in 2006, more than two thirds of the over 80 artists represented were men. And, more recently, and closer to home, Elm Green and Dragset. We were delighted to include their work, The Incidental Self in Lost and Found. But in the collectors, curated and created for the Danish and Nordic pavilions at Venice this year, only five of the 28 artists were men. No, just kidding. Tora, Laura, and Clara were not the majority, yet again. Here, as both Matthias and I will argue, there is no happy rainbow family. So given our curatorial focus on the archive and writing of history, we had to make that extra effort to find women artists. Otherwise, our exhibition, like so many, would just have been history repeating itself. It's not, as our discussion of some of the works in the exhibition will hopefully make clear, only about sexuality. It's about how majorities and minorities are created in context. And one of the key contexts for us and Matthias is the official versions of the past, who plays a role in history, who's present, 
Who's absent? What's visible? What's recorded? What's registered? And what's invisible because not deemed worthy of preservation or commemoration? The desire to challenge the gender role embodied in the theme of the 2005 Aarhus Festival stayed with us throughout postgrad studies and other jobs, slowly cooking, distilling, developing, and fueled by our political outrage at the growing conservatism and intolerance in Danish society. We were increasingly disturbed by the urge for conformity and concomitant hostility towards individuals, ideas, communities that didn't fit into mainstream culture and stereotypes as the straight, white, middle-class Dane. This was our local context in Denmark, but given the wider context of post-9-11 racism and closing of borders, we were increasingly driven to tell stories of different ways of living, different ways of thinking, and different ways of remembering. Made in Denmark, but focusing on wider global stories of alternative gender roles and sexualities, in an international exhibition of contemporary queer artists who share our desire to disrupt and question the status quo. In the vast and diverse queer field of queer art, we were constantly drawn to works that address the writing of histories and preservation of memories that deviate from the norm and dominant historical narratives. Works that document the experiences of minorities, address the traumas and crises of queer lives, and deconstruct both the private and public archives of memory. Works that interrogate official versions of the past, and traditional ways of writing history, and address the lack of narratives of queer lust and lust, homophobia and family breakups, same-sex love and relationship, hate crimes and discrimination, pride and shame. And now we're going to go on to the works. The artworks in Lost and Found querying the archive all question the power structures that are embedded and preserved in the archives we've inherited. They articulate and underline the political importance of constantly questioning, in our context, querying the archive. Many of the works in Lost and Found querying the archive draw on the visuals and sounds of the surrounding culture. Querying narratives of the mainstream, they use the visually saturated vortex of mass media, inventing new uses and in doing so perhaps re-editing not only existing footage, but also historical narratives. I need to say that the excerpts I can show here this evening of the video works are uh, all either preview or offline copies. Um, they're also inevitably not installed as the installations they are, so you'll just have to wait to go to Umeå in the new year to see them in glorious quality. The earliest work in Lost and Found traces popular culture back to the era of the Silver, Queen, silver Screen. In Celia Barriga's Meeting Two Queens from 1991, the artist recasts Greta Garbo and Melina Dietrich as unrequited lovers, bringing two stars that were never cast in the same movie together for the first time. And we're going to show a clip. Artists like Bariga's work can be seen to cinematically embody spectatorial negotiation by marginalized or excluded subjects, by re-editing and disrupting made in Hollywood codes and narratives. In Bariga's work, the historical dimension of fan culture and the lesbian subculture contemporary to the stars, all those rumors and gossip about their lesbianism or bisexuality, were they, weren't they? opens the narrative to other readings within and beyond the straight storyline. 
Bariga brings this subcultural subtext center stage, enacting lesbian identification and desire, making fan culture and subversive readings celluloid flesh. And whilst given the kind of material she has to work with, the total consummation of desire would be impossible, the following scene is about as close as we're gonna get. kinds of work can be seen as enacting queer desire and querying the mainstream media, mining the public domain of Hollywood. But Lost and Found also included more intimate personal memories and their enactment. In, yeah, is that? In Die Kleider meiner Mutter, Ingo Tauporn blurs the boundaries between documentary and fiction, using photographic restaging as strategy. In this series of photographs, the artist appropriates not only his mother's clothes, and they are literally his mother's clothes, but also her gestures and physical surroundings, her home, photographing his embodiment of her, or rather his memories of her. The complete archive consists of 65 pictures, a collection of all the detailed, invisible, everyday gestures of a housewife prior to, or separated from, the public performance they anticipate. As a male doppelganger of his mother, Torpon recasts himself in an immaculate suburban home and trimmed garden, inhabiting her space and performing her daily rituals. This series, based on years of intimate observation and coexistence, makes the private moments of many childhoods public. The intersection of the private and the public is very present in the Mumbai-based artist Tejal Shah's work. In the work, What Are You, from 2006, the very question of the title can be seen as an objectifying act of power in the context of societal insistence on fixed identity categories. In her two-channel video projection, Shah uses both her own and found footage to subvert fixed gender categories in a visual celebration of and tribute to the transgender hijra community in Mumbai. Can I show a
equality before law. The state shall not deny the state state shall shall not deny not deny to any person or equal protection of the law before law equal protection of the law protection within of the law the territories of India. India. The territory of India. archive is, as Heather Love has written in our book, not solely the preserve of positive images and happy endings. Tragic stories and negative affects take up an important part of our history of family traumas, hate crimes, and feelings of isolation. Many have experienced transphobia and homophobia in a world where choosing to live outside the reproductive nuclear family is not only regarded as a provocation, but in itself provokes violent discrimination. The Hitra woman here, given a voice and celebrated in Shah's work, are virtually untouchables in India's caste hierarchy. Their only way of earning a living is as sex workers. They're denied the rights enshrined in the Indian constitution, they quote here. The violence of discrimination is also addressed by Mary Coble's blood script from 2008. The work is based on the artist's earlier marker performances, where she stood for hours as people wrote terms of abuse on her body. Words that had been used against them, words that they had heard used against others, or words that they themselves had used against others. In Bloodscript, she took 75 of the most recurring hateful works, words from these performances and over 20 hours had them tattooed without ink on her own flesh. As blood rose to the surface of her pierced skin, an imprint of each word was made on watercolor paper. And it is these mirrored, mirrored images of each word that comprise her powerful installation in the exhibition. The performance behind these prints can be seen as a metaphor for the deep psychological wounds of hate speech. And the prints that remain after the scars have healed provide a tangible and physical record that belies the staying, saying, sticks and stones may break, break my bones, but words will never harm me. Coble has created an archive, an archive of names and terms of abuse, calling for remembrance and commemoration of the violence and discrimination society prefers to ignore and repress. Discrimination and stigmatization are inextricably linked to absences erasures and gaps, gaps in the historical narratives and mainstream representation. The first work I showed by Cecilia Barriga was from 1991, a found footage film. I'd like to end with an excerpt from another found footage film, Like Like by Elisa Kahin, the only work we commissioned for Lost and Found in 2009. In a performance of memory and subject negotiation of the American film she secretly watched it as a child at night, Kahin uses TV memories, reworked with their hues emotionally saturated from found and collected VHS tapes to expose and explore shared anxieties. 
She separates gestures, glances, objects from their original narrative context, focusing on the anticipation of catharsis and emotional peaks, creating her own stories with composite characters compiled from hundreds of different filmic sources. Elise is the kind of artist that travels around at last count with 700 films in her suitcase. We're going to see a clip. <clears throat> the clip is about four or five minutes because we couldn't really make it shorter. So I hope you bear with us. say this. Wait, don't hang up. I love you so much. Just, uh, been under a really a lot of pressure and I don't know, I feel like I'm all alone. <laughs> Are we happy? Are we not happy? Are we close, not close? Please just tell me, I'll be there. As I hope you can see from a very small excerpt, she, Kahin skillfully welds emotion, political analysis, and collective cultural memory in what she finds in other people's VHS cast-offs and hand-me-downs. Although making this work uh, posed particular challenges that also reflect reflection on the archive of female representation on the screen, both large and small. For the masturbation scene, for example, she had to use women's gestures and expressions from a rape scene, 
an abortion scene, dutiful marital sex, and sleeping. In order to create joy and release, as she told me, she needed to sample stories about boredom, violence, and the unconscious. These queer footage works in the exhibition are embedded in an appeal to spectatorial affect. The resonance and abiding fascination of visual familiarity jolted by intervention. We can all easily fill in the gaps between the images from Hollywood's extensive shock. What we hope the artists in Lost and Found Queering the Archive offer in editing between literal and metaphorical scenes and screens is the generation of a dialogue between each artist's carefully cut and pasted script and the spectator's own subjective and visual memories. Memory here, and this is important, is not seen simplistically. We're not offering any kind of subordinate truth versus official lies. What we're trying to do, rather, is draw attention to the potential malleability of the past and the ways different versions are promoted or silenced. And speaking of silencing, what I hope I've introduced here, and which Matthias will also discuss, is that many of the experiences and feelings these artists explore are not only absent from the mainstream archive, but also from any standard narrative of gay liberation, with its direct linear trajectory from the dark depths of the closet to the eternal sunshine of the Rainbow Family. Whilst we continue to fight for and celebrate any progress that is made in terms of basic human rights for all minorities, we both feel we need to be constantly aware of the commodification of alternative lifestyles and question any incorporation and the terms on which it's based. It would, of course, be illusionary to imagine that the resources of contemporary queer art can challenge the global dominance of Hollywood or the religious right and the repeated reversion of it, their less rabid bedfellows to family values. But what we hope the artists in Lost and Found Queering the Archive can offer is a destabilization of traditional narratives and gender roles a voice for that which is socially silenced and unacknowledged, and the emotional and mental space in which to rewrite and redirect our own more satisfying versions. There remain, as the querying of the exhibition title implies, a whole series of hopefully ongoing questions. Questions about fixed identity categories versus queer feminist practice, like making an exhibition about archival practice and questioning versus a definition or recipe for the right physical or compensatory archive. As Feather Love in her contribution to the publication says, there are many queer pasts. Some versions glitter with collective fantasies of greatness. Others have been rubbed smooth by constant handling. Some are obscure, having been forgotten or put away. Other versions of the past have been rendered ghostly through the weight of accreted longing, and some are covered by shadows, forgotten traces of ways of life that many would rather leave behind. So I'd like to end by returning to the three questions we started out with. What's in your archive? What do you remember? And what would you rather forget? Thank you. Take a 10 minute break. Some what, we, what, we, what we thought we'd do is um, like take a 10 minute break so people can, you know, go to the bathroom and get a drink, have a cigarette. Mm. And, then and then we move on to Matthias. Yeah, and then we can take questions and discussions at the end, perhaps. Unless you have any like urgent questions. I mean, if you have immediate you questions, that's right fine. Now, we can do that too. If not, 10 minutes, like 19, 25, we can start again. Go ahead. <laughs> Shout. Okay. You're presenting here. They all had a very strong emphasis on music to drive their kind of mm. narrative through. Mm. Is this representative of the rest of the films in the exhibition, in the archive? Uh, or the works I mean, that it's you can show on video, or I just wondering yeah, no, about it, it, how it, it, they all have this yeah. strong musical yeah. kind of 
I Try. mean, I think Matthias is going to be showing a clip from Connie Carlson's yeah, I Am Other, is which is without music. I think for both Cecilia Bariga and for Lisa Coheen, affect, and that was also important for us as curators in choosing the works, the affective power of music, I think, is really uh, important for both of them as artists, and especially mm -hmm. for Elisa, who actually works with composers. So it's very integral to her own practice to have music. But uh, these are the only two with music. And Elisa also remixes the... The, the sound herself, so she also works with, with the sound as an integral part of her work. But yeah, we also have, I'm going to show two clips without music, unfortunately, <laughs> for those music lovers. So it is, but well, also another piece in the exhibition by uh, Benny Nemirovsky Ramsey, he, that is a piece, like a five, five channel piece, uh, where he has remixed 1,000 pop songs. Um, so that's a, like, who, who, which he sings, uh, kind of a karaoke style. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of music in the mm. exhibition <laughs> in many ways, but um, used differently and for different purposes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Should we take a 10 minute break? Good. Thanks. Do we do that with this? Yeah.